Hi, I'm Logan Medish, host of the High Caliber History podcast, and on this week's episode, I'm sitting down with Paul Samazic of the Colt Archives. And if you've ever heard someone mention, uh, get a factory letter, or what does the letter say? Uh, that's what Paul does. He works in the Colt Archives, uh, going through the more than 150 years of storied Colt history, and helps collectors uh, figure out what exactly they've got in their gun, and, and uh, decide... Uh, if it's still in its original configuration, or maybe it's shipped to a famous person, uh, and a variety of other things. And so we're going to discuss what you can find out in a letter, what you can't find out in a letter, and what, in general, the Colt Archives has to offer. It's going to be a great episode, and I'm really glad you're here. Let's get into it. Paul Samozic holds a BA in history from the University of Connecticut, and after spending a number of years working with an insurance company, he's been at the Colt Archives since 2012, and he's answered thousands of inquiries on vintage Colt firearms for novices and experts alike. He lives in the woods in Connecticut with his wife and son, and when he's not collecting or studying Colt firearms, he's an avid hiker, golfer, and craft beer enthusiast. Paul, welcome to the show. Absolutely. So let's dive right into it. What came first, your industry, uh, your interest in history or firearms? So, you know, so you've got the BA in history, but you're working in the guns and working with the history. So how, how did that all come about? So, so it was the interest in, uh, in history that really, uh, that really came first. Uh, growing up in Connecticut, uh, the culture on firearms is not quite what it is in, uh, you know, some other areas of the country. So when I was growing up, uh, you know, outside of, uh, you know, some members of my family, uh, you know, either being hunters or occasional uh, sport shooting, there really wasn't, uh, you know, I, I didn't grow up around, uh, you know, around a lot of firearms. So it was really the, uh, the history aspect that, uh, uh, that really started uh, for me. Uh, my, my dad growing up, had a very extensive library, mostly early American history, Civil War history, uh, things like that, that kind of, uh, you know, through osmosis, I kind of picked up a very uh, you know, similar interest in, uh, in that type of stuff. Uh, so when I was, uh, uh, after high school, when I went to college, uh, I had kind of bounced around a couple majors uh, because it was more of, well, what can I do that's going to make me the most money? And a lot of those things were not things that were going to be, uh, that weren't interesting to me. Uh, so I struggled a little bit early on and then I actually took a class my uh, second semester uh, on Latin American history. And that really sucked me into, uh, you know, into that. And I decided that I was going to pursue something that I really enjoyed doing. Uh, and so here we are today. Uh, you know, I, I ended up starting working uh, at Colt uh, in 2012. And uh, from there, it was very, very easy to get, uh, you know, to, to really learn about a lot of Colt's history and how Colt's history ties very, very closely with American history and world history. And it all kind of ties together, uh, you know, with the firearms as kind of an accessory to that history. Gotcha. So obviously working Colt archives as opposed to, you know, working like on the factory floor, obviously that's a very different skill set. So how, how did you end up at Colt archives? Like what, what, uh, what are the requirements for someone to work in a position like that? So it's, it's very, um, you know, because it is a really uh, specialized kind of um, job, you're really evaluating, uh, you know, the, it's it's all primary sources that we're working off of. So it's, you know, it's original shipping and production uh, records. So coming into the job, having a lot of that experience, uh, you know, doing historical writing and research in college was able to kind of prepare me for the type of research that I would be doing here, researching and shipping records, trying to interpret what somebody 120 years ago, sometimes 150 years ago, is trying to, was trying to tell themselves so that we can interpret it and make sure that we're accurately giving, uh, you know, correct information to people who inquire with us about either specific firearms or if they're doing a research project on a book, uh, you know, if they're researching something specific or if they're researching something general, we have to be able to make sure that the information that we're giving uh, 
about is going to be absolutely accurate in terms of like, you know, what was supposed to, what was being recorded back then. Gotcha. So the cult archives uh, in, in one form or another has, has existed for a long time. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the background of how it started, where it came from, and what it has morphed into today? Yeah, so, so for some reason, uh, cult, you know, the, the records that we have, these were, the intention of these records was never meant to be something so that we could go back 150 years later and give somebody information because they're curious about the history of it. I mean, these are very basic, uh, you know, shipping ledgers. It was just record keeping guns being produced, guns going out, and that was really the, you know, the sole intent of the records. So somehow along the years, uh, and there's not really a ton of documentation about this, but these records were kept for some reason uh, for a very, very, very long time. And they were, you know, they were preserved uh, for a long time for Un unknown reasons. I mean, for, for pretty much any other thing, you know, if you have records that exist 10 years ago, uh, you know, chances are those records are probably going to be disposed of and gotten rid of. Nobody is really keeping things for historical foresight. So for some reason, and probably by a couple of miracles, uh, you know, the shipping records and a lot of the production records of these guns survived. Uh, the earliest ones that we have are from 1861. Uh, everything before that was either lost or destroyed. Uh, and then in terms of like, uh, you know, the actual service of people uh, paying us to research and document specific guns, uh, that really started probably in about the 1950s or 60s uh, with a, uh, a guy named Ron Wagner who kind of started a lot of the actual um, documentation uh, business side of it with uh, with cult archives and the letters that you have probably seen. So, and then from there, it's kind of gone, uh, you know, from historian to historian, and uh, you know, we've kind of been the caretakers of these uh, of the records uh, ever since. When the armory had a fire, I guess that was what back in 1864, I think. Yes. Uh, okay. So you mentioned you've got uh, records, you know, starting around 1861. Uh, was the earlier stuff, was it thrown away or did it fall casualty to the fire or are you guys not, not kind of sure? So nobody really knows for sure, but what of course happens with a lot of things historically is the romantic version is always that the Confederates burned down the factory and then therefore the records were also uh, were also lost to it. So, so, no, so a lot of the records where we have some damage or some gaps that nobody really knows 100% for sure what happened to the records because if the you know if the fire had destroyed all of the records why do we still have you know 3 or 4 years worth of records that were there uh you know prior to the uh, prior to the fire so i think it's a you know it's a combination of a lot of things i think some of them were probably damaged or destroyed i think some of them uh, you know people probably said well why do we need to really keep these these are 20 years old let's just get rid of them nobody's going to care and, you know, some of them just over the years of storage and being flipped through, uh, you know, there have been countless books and publications that have been written that have used uh, cult records for as a reference material, just from being handled and flipped through, uh, a lot of them have been damaged or destroyed, particularly the earlier records that we still have. Okay. Yeah. And I know, cause I've, I've had the opportunity to come up and visit you guys and see some of the stuff and. Uh, like some of the things that come to mind are some of the World War II 1911 shipping documents. And you guys, I mean, it's like carbon paper, carbon copy stuff. I mean, it's yep. so incredibly thin and delicate. And it's uh, yeah. it's amazing that, that that stuff has survived all these years. Because like you said, that's it wasn't designed to be a research tool. It was, uh, you know, it was a government document. It was a record of what you were shipping <laughs> Bookkeeping, out. Bookkeeping, basically. Bookkeeping, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, and you... you you know, once, hell, once your tax returns hit a certain age, you throw those away, you know? So why would you need to keep shipping records from 150 years ago for mm -hmm. some of this stuff? Okay. Now, obviously, in the, the almost decade that you've been there, I'm sure you've come across some amazing things in the archives. And I'm wondering if you can tell us uh, a couple stories about, you know, like maybe what's what's the coolest thing you've come across, you know, or, you know, the most unexpected or 
uh, some, something like along those lines. So there are there are certainly a lot of um, you know not a lot. They're obviously uh, you know very very scarce when you have guns that have particularly important uh, provenance, whether it be something to a president. Uh, I know you were at the uh, the NRA museum uh, for a while, and you probably are familiar with uh, Grover Cleveland's uh, eight gauge hammerless shotgun. That's one yep. of the items that's in the records. Uh, there are Bat Masterson guns, and uh, you know, recently there was a, a a gun that was attributed to uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, that is shown that showed up. But a lot of those guns, where you have a single individual person, I would say you know it's very rare that something like that just comes out of nowhere. So you don't get a lot of these things where you know. We don't have a lot of stuff on, you know, a weekly or monthly or even yearly basis where somebody calls and they're not expecting something to be, you know, attributed to a very, very famous individual like that. Okay. Um, what I have a personal affinity for is I like the otherwise nondescript gun that only through records can you show that it was shipped or sold to a particular location or individual uh, you know, kind of a, you know, a working gun that has history tied to either a specific, you know, it, it's something that's kind of indicative of an era or of a particular moment in time in, in history. So the one that always, uh, you know, in the last couple of years, the one that really sticks out to me is we had a, uh, we had a collector uh, who contacted us. Uh, he had a pre-World War II Colt uh, government model. 45 that was just a, uh, you know, otherwise nondescript, you know, very, very worn, a lot of holster wear, something that had been carried a lot. And he submitted it for research and, you know, just hoping that it was going to be a, you know, maybe a police department had it, maybe it was a, you know, you know, something of, you know, some, some kind of interest. Right. Well, the pistol ended up being part of a shipment of 30 guns that were actually shipped to Alcatraz prison. Oh, wow. In the 30s for their guards. And the reason they were able, we were able to, uh, that, that the collector was able to determine that the gun was likely for the guards is there is a picture of, uh, there's a picture from Alcatraz that shows a picture of uh, all the guards and the warden and a couple of other officials. Well, the guards all have uh, 1911 holsters. I don't know what, uh, what make they were. And there are, 30 Alcatraz guards. So you can kind of put two and two together from our records that, you know, it was a shipment of 30 guns. The, right. There's 30 guards with, uh, you know, government models on their hips. So you can kind of make that type of a, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's not that much of a leap of faith to say that that's what those guns were, uh, were being used for. Uh, so those are the kind of things that I really like to see is, uh, you know, really unexpected um, little little gems of uh, you know of history that kind of come out of the woodwork like that. So, you know, with guns that are engraved or embellished or have really really um, very important significant history, you know, a lot of those guns are either pretty much known for the most part, or you already kind of know what you're going to find sure. in the records. Uh, you know, if it's something where the specifications are an engraved gun. What I like is the stuff where it's really, really unexpected where, you know, Joe Schmo calls in and he's got an old, you know, $200 revolver and it shows going somewhere really, really intriguing. So Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's very cool. I, you know, and that's, that's one of the things to me that I, I really find fascinating about getting guns lettered. Um, and I've, I've, you know, I've, I've got a couple of Colts that are lettered. I've got a couple of Smith and Wessons that are lettered and stuff. And, you know, and, and none of my guns are remarkable in, in any way, but it's, Thank it's you. that, it's that hope that, you know, that maybe, you know, this was you know, Frank Hamer's, you know, yep. privately purchased piece or something that, you know, would have never had his name on it, but it was his gun or, you know, and of course I've, I've never gotten that lucky, but, but that's not the point <laughs> of it. Right. You know, um, it's just, it's also being able to, to confirm that the gun is still in its original configuration. Uh, Cause that's, uh, you know, that's, that's a big part of what you guys do too, as well. Um, you know, cause collectors, 
uh, kind of depend on you guys to know, you know, if, especially like if it's a special order barrel length or something like that. Um, if it if it doesn't show up in the letters, that's that's going to be a problem for what the collector may or may pay for something like that, right? Correct. Yeah. So so we we are the one of the things that is unique uh, with us, and also you know particularly with uh, you know Smith and Weston is by having those records where you can verify configuration you're you're not relying on opinion uh you are right. relying on uh, you know you're relying on documentation that was not really intended for collector verification later on down the you know later on down the road so by being able to document you know certain things uh you know one of one of the particular instances that we see a lot of is uh if you're familiar with say a, a fits special Yes. Uh, a lot of the, you know, and, and for people who may not know specifically what that is, uh, Colt employed a gunsmith uh, named J.H. Fitzgerald who performed these very distinctive modifications to his guns, uh, trigger guards cut away for easy access to the trigger, bobbed hammers, uh, you know, basically something that was going to be easily concealable. Uh, well, I would say that out of every one that comes through here for verification, uh, that is genuine, there's probably 50 to 100 that are gunsmith modifications after the fact. Yeah. And some of them are done to intentionally deceive, but a lot of them are also older modifications that were done because someone saw it in the, you know, the 1940s or the 1950s and they liked it. And it wasn't necessarily something that they did to deceive somebody. It was just a no different than customizing any other gun. And they did it. And then over the years, you know, it's, you know, it passes through ownership and then it gets to a point where maybe somebody who wants to deceive ends up with it. And so, so those are the types of situations uh, where, it's, where it's very important, uh, you know, to have documentation verifying configuration because without a document, you know, you're relying on the opinion of, of somebody and opinions are not always, uh, you know, not always the best or coming from, a, you know, coming from a good place. So. Sure. Yeah. And it, I think it's great that you bring up the fifth special because that, that jogs my memory and reminds me of a story when I was working at the NRA museum, uh, we had a guy local in the Northern Virginia area. Um, I don't remember exactly how he came about the gun, um, but he had, you know, a fifth special and he came in and and was hoping that we might be able to, you know, determine the authenticity of it because based on the serial number and stuff for the model and everything, it it was from around the time period when Fitzgerald was working there doing the modifications. Um, but of course, you know, we you know, I had no way of of being able to verify that information for him, and so of course I referred him to you guys and encouraged him to get the letter. And of course, then we started talking about the costs and this and that and. And, uh, and I want to talk more about the costs of the letters with, uh, with you here in a minute. Um, but it becomes that balancing act. You have to weigh the, the cost of the research to the cost of, of the gun. And from what I recall, uh, you know, the cost of the letter was almost as much as the cost of the gun because you really didn't pay a whole lot for the gun. And so it was one of those situations, you know, do, do I double my investment in this gun and, and it may end up, you know, being a bust. And so I, I encouraged him. I was like, you know, on, on the off chance, you know, that's that'd be a pretty good bet, you know. And uh, and so he went on his merry way and, and, and that was it. And about a year later, I guess, uh, I, I received an email from that guy. It's like, you know, hey, you may not remember me, but yada, yada, yada. And uh, said, so I took your advice and I lettered the gun and it was legit. It was the real deal. And I was so happy for him that that we you know, that you guys were able to confirm, you know, and and now the cost of the letter was immaterial, you know, it was it it did Correct. not matter because now that gun is worth ten times or more what it would have been if it had just been supposition that it had been an actual Fitzgerald Fitz special. So that's, that's yes. very cool that, that you mentioned Fitz because that, that jogged my memory on that. Yeah, it, it's definitely, as you, as you said, uh, you know, you, you do, you know, you should weigh the cost of that versus what the potential, uh, you know, potential benefit is, you know, for, for instance, a lot of 
even to this day, our most uh, our most requested archive letter is still on first generation single action armies. Okay. And the reason being is so many of them have been altered from their original configurations uh, that having the document confirming that the gun is still in the original configuration as it left the factory is tremendously more important for that model of gun than say a woodsman, you know, where, right. you know, you're talking about something that pro you're, you're talking about a model of gun that probably has not seen even close to the number of modifications that a first generation single action has. And there, there is a sliding scale of, you know, what models, you know, benefit the most from that type of, uh, you know, that type of information. Sure. Uh, a lot of collectors over the years have figured out there are certain time frames of where you are more likely to probably find an interesting shipping destination based off of who Colt was doing business with at that particular juncture in time. Sure. Uh, so, so over the years, it's really, uh, you know, it's kind of a continuing education. And then you kind of can make some calculated risks on, you know, like, like, so let's say, for instance, that, you know, you have guns in, you know, the early part of the 20th century, uh, you know, say 1910, 1912, where the Mexican Revolution was going on, Colt was shipping guns to Mexico. I can kind of guess that I have a better chance than I do in certain other time frames to get a good letter with a good shipping destination in this time frame, uh, right. you know, based on what I know about what was going on in the world at that time. Sure. Now I had I had mentioned you know people having to to weigh the costs of the letters and different things and uh, one of the things that when when people go to the the Cold Archives website and pull up the list if they're going to have their gun lettered they'll notice that there's a, a bunch of different costs and it's not a you know hey your gun's going to cost X amount of dollars to letter or across the board whatever it is um, you guys have kind of a sliding scale on price uh, for different makes and models and embellishments and and things of that nature. Can you explain uh, why why the costs are different and why it's not just well you're looking up the gun you're looking up the gun why why is it different? Yep. So so costs are generally uh, and part of the reason is uh, you know we you know lower dollar value guns uh, you know you don't want to you know you want to encourage people to you know to to get letters on them so it wouldn't be you know, for a, a $200 police positive, it wouldn't be worth it for most people to spend $200 on also getting a document on, on a, you know, on a lower dollar value gun. So, sure. so we, we do want to encourage people to, uh, you know, to, to get letters on some of those things. So you have to kind of, uh, you know, weigh A, what the potential value of the gun is. If it's a lower dollar value gun, uh, it doesn't make sense to, to charge people uh, you know, more money for, for a gun that may not have the collector value. Sure. Um, some guns are also significantly more difficult to, uh, to research. Uh, we do have some limited indexing that has been kind of ongoing and still goes on to this day to try and make our research uh, you know, e easier to do. So that we can, you know, do a better job on our turnaround times. But still, for the most part, uh, a lot of the research is still, okay, here is when the gun would have been made. Uh, here is where we can start looking for the serial number. And then we are just looking for that number from a particular beginning point. And because Colt did not ship or produce guns in really any type of uh, consecutive serial number order, uh, some of these researches can be very, very time consuming. Okay. Uh, so for instance, we have, um, you know, th these are, this is uh, a book of Colt Civil War records. This is one of the ones that we still uh, have on site. And essentially what it is, it's just 400 plus pages of numbers. And the numbers are not in any type of, they're not in any type of order. At this particular point in time, they're not really in much date order. Uh, so it's a lot of manual scanning for serial numbers uh, at, at this point. So kind of weighing the cost, it really has to deal with, uh, you know, what, what is the potential value of the gun? Would it be worth, you know, is it, is it worthwhile for this person to get the documentation at a particular cost? And how long of a research is this type of gun going to be? Uh, for it, because if it's something that's going to be, you know, generally more time consuming, 
you know, then that's going to be more of a cost, uh, you know, for, for that type of research. So, so that's why a lot of the percussion guns, when you go back to 1860 armies, 1851 navies, uh, because the guns are not really in record in, in any type of order, and because the records are, you know, tend to be in worse condition, it requires a much more careful and slow research to make sure that you don't miss a number and have to go back and, and start all over again. So, right. So it's not. It's people need to understand that you guys aren't just going to an electronic database and typing in a number and finding the records. And I think that that might be a misconception people have because if you go onto the Colt yeah. website, there is a serial number search that that can kind of narrow some things down. So I, I would imagine that probably leads to a little bit of confusion and, and misunderstanding for folks as to what it actually entails for you to do a full research on these guns. Correct. And, and the first thing you did is you described my dream scenario of being able to type a number into a database and have it direct me right to a shipping uh, record. But yeah. like you said, it's, it's unfortunately not the case. Uh, you know, the, the overwhelming majority of the research, while we do have some limited indexing that was either done by us or done by some people who have written, uh, you know, books on particular models of guns, uh, you know, left for us to be able to use, uh, the overwhelming majority of it is still very much manual and old school. Uh, indexing takes a lot of time. Yeah, uh, especially to make sure that it's done accurately. Um, if you hire an outside place to do it, it becomes it's very, very expensive. Uh, we recently over the last couple of years, uh, because of a lot of the uh, condition of the records, uh, we we had about a two year project where we did hire a company to come in and uh, digitally scan all of our records. Uh, essentially for preservation purposes uh, sure. you know a lot of the records you know every day that goes by you know you lose a little bit of information if you're constantly flipping through them so so right now while everything is digital and we work almost exclusively off of scans of the original records uh it is not digital to the point where we can just type in a number and it brings us directly to the uh, to the to the shipping record so you know uh, there are some researches that can take hours or days depending on the model and depending on what time period in the records that we are, uh, that we are searching. So. Gotcha. Yeah. And it, you know, it's interesting. You, you held up the, the civil war records book. And when I came to visit you guys, that, that was actually one of the books that you guys were gracious enough to have out on the yep. table. And I, I got to, to look through that book. Um, and, and you're right. There really is no, no semblance uh, of numerical order in there. And, and no. the, the thing that really sticks out in my mind is I, I, I just happened upon uh, January 10th, 1862, which is, of course, the, the day that Sam Colt passed away. And, uh, and, and yeah, there really was no rhyme or reason to the serial numbers listed uh, on that date. But it also ties back that I think it's interesting that, you know, these are just these are business records, you know, this isn't someone's diary. And so uh, I found it interesting that, you know, you, you go to the day that the man who created the company dies and there's a listing of X amount of guns that ship to this manufacturer in the morning and this amount of guns and serial numbers that ship to this, this different uh, company in the afternoon and no mention that, that the patriarch of the company has, yeah. has passed away. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and you, you know, you think to yourself, wow, that's, that's a big deal. The, the wealthiest I, man in America at his death. <laughs> right. You know, how is that not noteworthy of even something in the margins? Right. Yeah. Um, but but it wasn't. And that's uh, their their business documents. And and so I, I, I thought that was really interesting uh, to to see that and that kind of uh, stark contrast between what I maybe naively was expecting versus what was actually in the records. Yeah. And it's you know, it, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, we have we uh, particularly as collectors, we put a lot of importance on on historical facts and, and what was going on at the time. Whereas for the person who was recording that, that was their job and they were just doing their job at the time. And they could never have foreseen that we would want to keep these records in some kind of temperature controlled facility in order to maintain the integrity of them 
for right. as long as for as long as we possibly uh, for as long as we possibly could. So it's just one of those things where you're taking a, you know you're taking a document that they had no they were these were not done for us. It was just that was that person's job at the time. You record the serial numbers of the ones that were in that box going to Hartley and Graham in New York City, and you and that was your that was your job that day, and that's all that that is. So. Right. It's, hey, they're not paying me more to record Sam's death. So we're moving they're on, not. right? <laughs> <laughs> so, and we may have, have already answered this question uh, in talking about serial number searches, but what would you say is, is the most frustrating part of working with the archives? Um, and maybe what's, what's a misconception that people might have about the archives? Um, I, I think that it's a, uh, you know, I think one of the, uh, I think one of the big things is that um, I think a lot of people look at a, a look at an archive letter, and they think that it is the, uh, they, they look at it as the end all be all of everything that that gun has. So like, if you look at, a, if you look at an archive letter, it's going to have original factory specifications and shipping information. Well, one of the things that happens often, and I have a, a, a kind of a sad example of this for somebody out there who owns this gun. Um, but if you are looking for a, you know, let's say a factory letter indicates that a gun originally left with a nickel finish on it, mm -hmm. that does not necessarily mean that the nickel finish that the gun is currently sporting is the original finish that was on the gun when it, when it left the factory. Right. Uh, you know, there there's a lot of instances where people will get a letter to verify original specifications, and and you know, let's talk. We'll, we'll just stick with the nickel uh, finished situation, and they'll say people are telling me that the gun is not original, but the letter says the gun was nickel when it left the factory, and it is nickel now. So how can they say that it is not that it was not nickel when it left the factory? Right. So. The letter is really a tool. It's one of the tools that is available to people who collect cults. To it, it's a part of the story, but it is not the entire story of not the entire story of the gun. So, in a case like that, you also have to be familiar with what a period nickel finish is going to look like from that time yeah. period. So, if you're looking at a gun from say, uh, let's say you're looking at a gun from 1900 and the gun is nickel and the letter says it's nickel there are other things that you have to know about a nickel finish from 19 from Holt's nickel finish from 1900 that are going to be apparent on a gun that is originally factory factory nickel there are going to be small parts on many of the guns that were going to be that would have been nitro blued or fire blued like the trigger the hammer the screws so when you see things like that where a gun is supposed to have these particular things and it no longer does you can kind of advise people that uh, you know it doesn't look like that is the original nickel finish that is on the gun because it is also lacking these other characteristics that would have been um, would have been standard for that gun in that time period. So, unfortunately, we do have to give out a really significant amount of bad news, uh, you know, bad news to people on on a lot of the guns because a lot of them have been altered. And a lot of people see things and they, they want to believe certain things about, about their gun that their grandfather passed on to them. Yeah. You know, my grandfather told me that this gun was owned by such and such. And then the gun ends up being produced after so-and-so died. So right. you have a gun that couldn't possibly have been owned by that person, but you get stories that get passed down from generation to generation. And, sure. you know, in a classic kind of game of telephone, the story changes as time goes on and, you know, it becomes Jesse James's gun or Bonnie and Clyde's gun. And then yep. sometimes through our documentation, while there's a lot of guns that can be verified, there's also a lot of, a lot of things that can be disproven. So it, it kind of becomes sad sometimes when you have to give a lot of, you know, you have to give a lot of bad information, uh, you know, out to people about things that they have, had for a long time or that, that have been passed down from generation to generation and they're they're hoping and expecting that the documentation is going to support a story and then 
everything that we have from our records is contrary to that. So it, it can be, you know, it can be disappointing, unfortunately, for a lot of people, uh, because sometimes these, the stories don't really, uh, you know, don't really jive with what they've been told about something that they own. So. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, having to come face to face with the fact that granddad may have been uh, a, a bit of a liar. <laughs> Embellishing. <laughs> Embellishing. <laughs> yeah. It, it's Absolutely. not always not always yep. comfortable to have to to realize <laughs> that about someone you know and, and there was a there was a specific instance a few years ago uh there was a there was a single action army uh that was that was sold at auction uh and it was accompanied by a factory letter and all of the specifications of the gun matched the letter the serial number was matching uh so if you didn't know what you were looking at in terms of the model itself. And this is why the letter needs to be a tool rather than an end all be all of, of everything. You also have to, you know, you have to be, you have to educate yourself about a model of gun. You can't just look at a gun in a document or documents that are accompanying it. You know, you have to be able to physically evaluate, you know, it, it's a learning experience, you know, nobody learns this stuff right away. You know, I've made mistakes on my own personal collection because either I wasn't careful or it was a model that I wasn't familiar with and I had, I was overconfident in my ability to evaluate something. Sure. And you're not a collector if you haven't paid for that tuition before. Yep. Um, but what had happened is there was a gun where the letter was a direct shipment to Bat Masters. Okay. And what has happened is a number of over the years, a number of public publications, uh, research volumes have published serial numbers of well-known famous destinations uh you know to individual people so what has happened is you know with the collectible gun market there are a preponderance of fakes yes. and counterfeits and very skilled and elaborate counterfeits that can fool a lot of knowledgeable people well what had happened with this particular gun is it, it was definitely a built-up gun and the reason it was it was discovered was because the way that the serial number was laid out on a particular part of the gun was the opposite way that it should have been uh, that it should have been laid out at that particular time period. Ah. So, so people who were familiar with single action armies, it, it was based. It, it's very it, it's elementary knowledge for somebody who is familiar with that gun or who collects that gun, but for somebody who may just want a piece of American history or to someone who is just a collector of Americana, they look at the gun, they look at the specifications that are on the letter, they look at the matching serial number that's on the letter and they, they, they eliminate all of their doubts very quickly without further evaluating it. And I, I believe that that gun sold for almost six figures if I'm remembering correctly. Wow. Uh, so it was a very expensive mistake for somebody who saw the letter and it matched the gun, but they may not have known very much about evaluating that particular model of gun. Right. And they just, you know, they, they kind of blindly went into it without really knowing about what to look for on that particular model. Of gun. Right. So a letter is really a tool for further, you know, for, for evaluating further or for verifying something that you may already, uh, may already know. But I think a lot of people look at it as, as an end to as basically the definitive piece of documentation, but it really should be used as a tool to evaluate further. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's interesting that you mentioned, you know, if it's, if it's marked not in the, the correct manner and that's, you'll see in a, in a lot of the, the detailed reference books that I know you have, and I've got, you know, you'll got guy you've got guys in there like, all right, well, the serial number needs to be three sixteenths of an inch high and it shouldn't have serifs or, you know, and so you get folks who are just looking, okay, yeah, numbers matching, we're good to go. But maybe the number on the trigger guard, you know, that they're stamped a little too big. And that's, yep. that's the tell that unfortunately someone might not, uh, might not know unless they're very well versed uh, mm -hmm. and, and have been a student of Colt for a long time. Um, an, an interesting thing that I want to ask and, and it might be a little controversial uh, have there been any instances where you guys have been asked to letter or verify a gun that uh, has had gone through the hands of R.L. Wilson, Larry Wilson, uh, who, of course, is one of the most 
well-known and in many circles infamous cult guys out there have you come across any instances where larry built up a gun in such a way to make it marketable to someone and then it finally comes back to you guys at some point and maybe it doesn't doesn't quite jive um you know it's really hard to uh not any that i can recall where somebody specifically mentioned to us that that R.L. Wilson was like the source of either the gun or the document or, or anything like that. I, I am sure that there are some that have probably, uh, you know, that have probably come through here. But in terms of ones where there was like a, uh, you know, a, a, a gun that was attributed to him that had maybe stirred up some controversy, uh, I don't think, not since I have been here, uh, can I recall of an, an actual, like, an example of that where somebody submitted something to us and we knew for a fact that that's where it had gone and maybe there's something questionable about it. I don't doubt that maybe somebody sent in for a letter on, on one possibly, but mm -hmm. not one that I can recall, uh, you know, knowing specifically about. Gotcha. Okay. Now, if, if there was one thing that you could go back uh, at, at any period in Colt's history uh, to any of the people working there, if you could go back to them and and be like, hey, I know you do such and such. Can you make sure to record this or that or the other? Because it'll make my job in 125 years so much easier. So is, is there one thing that you wish the records had that, that they just don't? The, the one thing that comes up on a nearly daily basis is specific date and serial number cutoffs for changes in features or appearances on, on particular models of guns. You okay. know, one of the things that I think a lot of cult collectors try to do, and, and I stopped trying to do this a long time ago because it's just, it's frustrating and it just, uh, it's not going to get you anywhere, uh, is people want to, you know, you know, collectors of just about anything, what they want to do is they want to be able to put everything into nice, clean, cutoffs and yep. you know they started doing something here they ended doing it here and then they started doing it a different way here and then that ended here and they switched it, it, it just it just doesn't happen in, in Colt's records you know I mean right. one, of, one of the things that Colt is notorious for is they would not waste parts so sure. if you were transitioning from say uh, you were transitioning from one model to another uh, one of you know, if you were transitioning, say, from the new police revolver to the police positive revolver, there is a long transition period where you have frames that are marked new police, but then they have barrels that are marked police positive on the barrel because what they did is they had all of these leftover frames that were already rolled and marked for the new sure. police, but you can't just scrap thousands of thousands of frames. You can't really waste them all. Uh, right. So they would then just build the police positive off of those particular frames. So that would really be the one thing that if, you know, if I could go back to the, go, you know, go back to the factory, I would say, Hey, can we start a different serial number range or like make <laughs> it really, really clear where all of these transitions, you know, kind of, uh, you know, kind of start and end, because I'm going to be answering questions about this for the rest of my life every single day. <laughs> and, and nobody's going to be happy with my answer because they want a nice clean cutoff and it just never happens. And, right. you know, and that didn't only happen in the 19th century and in the early 20th century. It, it continues to happen to this day because you don't want to, you know, if you have all of these leftover parts from, say, a project where you were initially slated to do a thousand of them. And let's say you only get orders for 500 of them what do you do with the other 500 barrels and slides or cylinders? Right. You don't melt them. You use them in a, you use them in another way. And, sure. you know, a lot of cult firearms throughout, you know, throughout history, I, I can't think of a single model that was immune to, to something, something like that, where you have all of this overlap sure. uh, you know, for that. And, and the same thing goes with, you know, they didn't assemble guns in consecutive order. They didn't ship guns in consecutive order. So you ha so it makes it even more difficult because you have guns that may have shipped out later than when a particular feature was still available, but right. it was assembled five years ago, but then it didn't ship until five years later. And you have all of this, 
you have all of this overlap that, that happens and it can be very frustrating, particularly for a lot of collectors because, you know, and, and I'm the same way. I would have, I like for it to be, it's nice and easy to have a nice clean, clear explanation, right. but it just doesn't happen. So I've sort of given up on trying to, uh, trying to make sense of, of that. It just is, it's just part of it. It is what it is. That's how it happened and you can't change it. So. Right. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, they forget that as, as collectors, you know, we have, our own terminology and, you know, and it might be, you know, such and such model, second change or third variation. It, it wasn't like that to the guy on the line. It was still just a such and such model. And, and we forget that, that the terminology that we use, uh, that we've tried to make things, uh, put them into nice little boxes, like you said, it, that's yes. just not how it worked for them in the factory because they're viewing those items in a very different manner than we as collectors view them. Correct, yes. Yes, it, it's, very, it's very difficult to go back and try to categorize the way things were, you know, you know, di different, uh, you know different things. So it's, uh, you know, you go back and, uh, you know, what, one of the things that happens a lot is uh, a specific example would be on the 1911A1 when they switched to, from blue to parkerizing, Colt yeah. just kept it as blue because they didn't care that, you know, it was sure. not, it, it was not something that, you know, so, so that's one of the things is when we do letters on A1s, our letters will say blue. And the reason being is that's all Colt really kept track of is they didn't make any change. So, so occasionally we do get questions about that is that, Hey, my gun, is, my gun is parkerized. It's in the right serial number range for a parkerized A1. Why does my letter say blue? And the reason is because Colt record keepers, they didn't care about you. Right. <laughs> they only, they, they were, they were, they, they cared, they cared about the Germans. So they were, you know, when they were just, rubber stamping all of the you know all of the all of the records nobody said hey jim you put blue on this ledger it's supposed to be parkerized can you fix this no they were they were concerned about getting as many functioning firearms into the hands of gis as they possibly could uh, right. rather than making sure that the records were totally 100 percent accurate as to, in terms of you know what what particular finish was being uh, was being done at the gun at the time. So so right. so a lot of information has also been uh, you know people have gone back and you know through significant amounts of physical evaluation of particular guns in particular time frames. You can come up with okay at approximately this serial number, this seems to be right. where the change from blue to parkerized happened. But there's a lot of overlap because of the way manufacturing was. They weren't concerned about keeping track of, you know, okay, only up to serial number 780,000 can we blue the guns. And then from right. there, we have to make sure that we are parkerizing the guns. It was really just, we don't care when you put them together. You just need to get them together and finish them however. So Right. Sure. One of the things I've noticed, and, and I'll use one of my own guns that, that I have as an example, and, and I've noticed it on some of the, some other guns of the models. Uh, I have a second generation single action army. Um, that, that's four digit serial number. So it was the first year that, that they reintroduced them. Um, but I've noticed, uh, and on my particular letter, under type of grips, it says not listed. Uh, and, and I know that on, on other guns, you know, from similar time periods and stuff that, you know, the grips may be listed. And so I'm curious, were, were the guys who were recording this stuff, were they just kind of doing it in a hurry and sometimes they didn't bother to write down the type of grips or was it possible that, you know, perhaps they were, they were recording this batch and, and they didn't have grips on them yet, or how, how might that happen? So, so that particular instance, uh, if it's a, if the grips are not listed, you you would be assuming standard issue grips for the time period. So, for instance, a single action in that time period, you're going to have the black composition, uh, you know, rubber 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 stocks on it. Right. So, if they were going out on every gun, they it, it was basically sort of a shorthand by omission. You know, you would assume standard issue, uh, you know, standard issue grips uh, on the gun. And they did that through most, most time periods. Uh, you know, there, there are a couple of periods where um, they were transitioning from one type of grip to another. 
where you'll have about a year or two where they are specifically describing one standard grip or another. Uh, mm -hmm. But for the most part, if, it, if that was the overwhelming amount of standard issue grips, they're not usually going to list something like that unless it was a special order of some sort. So for instance, right. you know, if you have a single action from that time period, if it's got wood or ivory or pearl, that will be specifically mentioned because it would have cost extra, it would have been a special order. Uh, but for a lot of standardized features, they're usually not going to describe a standardized feature uh, in, in, the, in the records, just kind of shorthand by omitting, omitting that particular piece of information. Okay. Yeah. Cause the, the, the gun that I have, when I picked it up, uh, it's, it's got vintage mother of pearl grips on it that, that are, yeah. you know, of, of the right age for that gun. So I was, you know, kind of hoping, well, maybe it was a special order, uh, but you know, it came back not listed. So it was just, just someone nice. wanting to, wanting to get on the bad side of general patent and put some, some mother of pearl <laughs> or ivory grips and stuff on it, you know. Uh, Wor worse things that happen to guns than have a nice set of mother of pearl on them, that's for that's <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So as, as we wrap up here, I, I have one question that, that I always ask uh, guests on the show, uh, and I'm going to put a little bit of a twist on it for you. I normally ask people, you know, what, what gun designer, living or dead, would you want to meet and why? And obviously, since you work at Colt, you know, the, the easy answer to that would be Sam Colt, right? Um, but I'm curious to know, is, is there someone else in the history of the Colt company that you would really want to sit down with and, and pick their brain from, from any time period in the company? So what, it, what is very interesting about, um, about Cole, this is actually a very easy answer for me, is it would actually have to be Elizabeth Cole. Okay. Um, so, so after Sam died, uh, Elizabeth Colt basically ran the show for, you know, basically for the, for the better part of four, four decades. Uh, Elizabeth was very, very involved in the community in Hartford and in Connecticut, uh, which for that time period, it was very, very unusual for a, uh, for a woman to be of real, you know, I mean, significant provenance at that time. Right. And she essentially, you know, because Sam died so young, you know, she was in charge when a lot of Colt's most famous firearms were the ones being, being produced. You know, she stewarded the company basically through the Civil War uh, and then through the introduction of the single action army mm. and through the introduction of all of Colt's double action revolvers and also just from being as prominent of a of a citizen of you know Connecticut and of the you know of the city where she lived, uh, you know, she I, I think sitting down with Elizabeth would be you know extremely interesting because she actually was at the head of Colt longer than Sam would have uh, would have been, wow. and, and so I, I think a lot of uh, you know I think a lot of history uh, you know is you know. A lot of the history of Colt as a company and of its influence, particularly in this area, uh, would be could be there could be a lot extracted from from Elizabeth's experience uh, running the company uh, during during that time frame from you know from 1862 until she uh, uh, she she eventually donated a lot of uh, you know a lot of their personal possessions to some of the museums uh, around here. But I, but I think Elizabeth would be an extremely interesting person to sit down and to sit down and talk to, uh, particularly because of all of the things that she oversaw when she was, uh, you know, kind of running the show. So, awesome! That's a great answer, and I, I I think that's interesting. You mentioned that she ran the company longer than Sam did, and 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 was there with the single action army. I I think a lot of people because he died so young, they don't necessarily realize that you know the single action army, one of the most well known Colt guns ever made. Sam had been dead for 11 years. He never, never, never saw it. And, uh, you know, exactly. and, and another interesting thing with Sam is he's been quoted on, no, on numerous occasions. He was, he did not like the idea of double action revolvers because he thought that double action revolvers, because of the increase in trigger pull would, it would affect the accuracy of of the gun. And then if you look at, you know, what has happened with double action revolvers, they became 
I mean, a, tr a you know, an extremely important part of, I mean, there are more Colt double action revolvers than were ever produced in, sure. you know, single action revolvers. And, you know, you, now you have iconic guns like the Python and, you know, the Diamondback and a lot of the snake guns that people, you know, double action revolvers survive to this day. Right. And Sam didn't really, wasn't really born to the idea of, of them, uh, you know, when, when he was still around, so. That's funny. And Sam was such an interesting businessman. It's, it's, it's uh, interesting to me that, that he, he kind of read the market wrong with that and, and with the double action, uh, you know, I, I would bet a couple of his big regrets would be not embracing the double action and letting Rollin White go off to Smith and Wesson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sam is a, Sam is a very, uh, Sam is one of those guys where it's a, uh, he, he was one of those guys that really, it was a, a burned bright for a, a lot of very high highs and very low lows for him over the course of, uh, you know, over the course of, of uh, you know, when he was, uh, you know, when, when he was in charge of everything, you know, you know, he, he, he died very wealthy, but he was yeah. also destitute <laughs> a, a lot during the, uh, you know, during, during the time when he was developing a lot of his, uh, you know, a lot of his stuff. So, Sam is one of those guys that really it was a, you know kind of a burn bright for a short period of time, and then you have Elizabeth where for a long period of time kind of uh, you know really stewarded it uh, everything from from Colt until she you know until she passed away. So you have two very interesting uh, you know people kind of side by side who are very very different. Right, absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you, Paul, for taking some time out of your day to, to come and chat with us here on the, the High Caliber History Podcast. I, I really appreciate it. You're um, welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And if, if folks are interested in learning more about the process or maybe even getting one of their own guns lettered, they can go to coltarchives.com and check out the information there. Uh, there will also be a link to it in the show notes so you guys can get to it nice and easy. Once again, Paul, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Have a great day. You too. Thanks. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the High Caliber History Podcast. Really appreciate you being here. Hope you enjoyed it. Please feel free to share this with someone that you think might enjoy it, maybe a, a cult fan in your life. Uh, again, I appreciate you being here, and we'll see you again next week for another great episode. <laughs>